Welcome to the Myth and Magic Authors Podcast, folklore and fantasy topics aimed at creative storytellers. To write stories and challenge your brain with exciting ideas, delve into these presentations and reflections. See how fantasy realms are based on actual world history, legend, and lore. Study fairy tales, nature fables, and supernaturalism to engage in a jumble of concepts that will trigger your fancy and get you writing imaginatively. Now, here's your host, Neil Mack. Hello, fantasy fiction fans and fantasy creatives everywhere. Today, I wanted to talk about how one can get over a writing logjam. And I wanted to bring you eight ways to overcome stagnation and talk about what happens when the momentum stops and how to complete a semi-finished work. And the reason I want to tackle this is because I think a lot of people have got a semi-finished work somewhere on a file or even on bits of paper and they just need to get it finished off. So how do you get over that writing logjam? This all entered into my head last week when a friend of mine asked me about my NaNoWriMo 2021 project. And while he didn't exactly gasp, he seemed impressed at least when I told him that I'd completed over 50,000 words in 30 days. Although, as we all know, the actual work, in other words, the retouching, the revisions and the editing has of course yet to begin. And I didn't tell him that part. But he was impressed that I'd written 50,000 words. And like I said at the time to you on this show, it's not just 50,000 words that were written, but it's 50,000 ideas. I had to use my imagination for the whole of that 30 days. Anyway, going back to my friend. My friend then confessed that he has a book which is about 70% complete. Those were his words. About 70% complete. And the manuscript for that project has been, according to him, floating around for over two years. He suggested that he couldn't spur or catalyse himself enough to finish it. But he then said to me, Neil, can you give me some advice? Can you advise me how I might reinvigorate my interest in the project and craft that last few thousand precious words to get it finished? Well, I didn't have an immediate answer for him and we weren't in a situation which I could continue discussing things because we were at a uh, lecture. And I vaguely thought about word sprints, which if you don't know what they are, they're consecutive writing sessions that you complete against the clock with a temporary break in between them. But when I reconsidered my friend, who is a man in his 70s, he's from an academic background, he retired from teaching uh, at least 10 years ago. I reasoned he would probably never commit to something as natty and as spiffy as word sprints. And I have to tell you that this guy doesn't even use social media. I couldn't really say to him, oh yeah, try word sprints. I don't think he would get it. But his predicament did make me acknowledge that there must be thousands of great authors out there who have exactly the same problem as my friend. And that is an almost finished book that requires a splendid, perhaps heroic, cavalry charge, if you like, to get it over the line. Otherwise, that project threatens to become an albatross around their neck, like an unpleasant encumbrance that threatens to burden them for their remaining days. So yes, the book does need to be completed. And I wanted to give my friend and others like him every encouragement to get the job done. So here's what I'm going to recommend to my friend. And also I recommend it to anybody else who is 70% of the way through a project and now they've left it and they don't know how to go back to it. Number one, start writing a synopsis. We often think, don't we, that a synopsis is only for a novel. And it's only for a completed work. But I heartily recommend that even semi-finished works ought to be summarised. And of course, most of us think of a synopsis as a summary 
or a condensation of an entire work, which is probably why we think it can only be used for a completed work. And yes, it is. And of course, we think it's only for a work of fiction, which of course it often is. But it's also, I just want to bring these three points home to you. It's also a list of all the main points that you, the author, want to make. It's a roadmap of ideas. And it's a list of components that you, the author, have collected that will become an important and an interesting book. So yes, a synopsis isn't just a summary, it's also a useful tool for you to be able to see where you're at. And that's why I think it needs to be written for semi-finished works and also for non-fiction works. And additionally, I think you should start writing it early. In fact, I think you should start writing it when you're a little over halfway through your first draft. Because, like I say, it's a list of main points. It's a roadmap of ideas. And it's a list of components. There is never a good time to write a 500 to 800 word synopsis anyway. Because it's an awful duty. And of course, that's a good reason to start the assignment early. Why not? The chore must be done eventually because your agent and your publisher and the press will require it. So why not summarise everything you've got so far, even if you haven't entirely completed the project? So I think you should list your points in a column so that your thoughts are accurately organised. And then I want you to think about the following things. And I'll go into them into more detail in a moment. Think about the premise, think about the book hook, think about the cornerstones of your project, think about the characters, and think about the subplots. All of those things will go into a proper and fully written synopsis at the end of your project, so you may as well think of those constituent parts now. So let's go into more detail on what I meant by those bits. The first thing to do is to establish your premise. What I mean by that is what's the theme of your topic? Where and how will conflict take place and or develop? And don't forget, conflict will be present in non-fiction too. If it isn't there in your non-fiction, then you've got problems, Houston. The theme is the main idea or if you like the underlying meaning or the message that you intend to explore in your narrative. If you want to know more about how to establish a, a premise, I do go into greater detail about theme in my blog post, which is titled How to Order Your Novel's Hierarchy, and you can find it at neilmack.me. The next thing to do is to develop a book hook. What is a book hook? Well, it's about what qualities you and your book possess that will attract the readers. What I mean by that is what promises will you make and what promises will the book make and how will you commit to those promises and what rewards will you offer your readers once they've completed the book? Because Whatever you reward them with will be how you ensure that your readers are engaged. So you're going to be asking yourself, why am I writing this book? But you're also asking yourself a more open question, which is why would anybody read this book? And then you're going to make a list of the reasons. And that's how to create your book hook. The next part is to collect crucial cornerstones. You wouldn't bake a cake if you didn't have eggs and flour and the baking pan and an oven, right? You wouldn't build a house unless you had wood and cement and machinery, a blueprint and some land to put it on, right? A book is the same. Words are the eggs and the flour, or the wood and cement. They are simply ingredients. Words are just ingredients, and I think that you've been giving them, and I'm sorry about this, but you have, you've been giving them unfair and exalted status because ingredients are not that important. Not really, not in the scheme of things. 
So you need to put your word count aside for a moment and you need to ask yourself why you're writing the book in the first place or indeed baking a cake or building a house. Because the answer to that significant question is what I call the cornerstone of your project. For example, if you knew before mixing that you were baking a birthday cake, it would be a lot easier to finish and decorate that cake, wouldn't it? Or if you knew before hammering that you were constructing a cabin for your family just for the weekend, then it would be a lot easier to finish and decorate, wouldn't it? So that's what I mean. Your agent, your publisher, your editor, and of course all your readers will want to know why you decided to write the book, so you need to know it yourself. Once you've figured out the answer to it, write it down. Because I've found that um, it's such a flighty thought sometimes that it can be quite mischievous and quite flattery. And these type of thoughts need to be weighed down in, in big, bold words on a sheet of paper. Otherwise, they, I've found that they tend to blow away. Now, if you have any difficulties with this task, ask yourself about the inciting incident. In other words, what made you want to write this book in the first place? Because that's typically where you'll find your answer to the question. What's the question again? What's the question again? Why did you decide to write this book? Once you know why you're writing it, you'll have a much better understanding of where the project is going and how it should end. So then you can plan the climax, which is the last 30% of the book, just like a baker or a builder might envision a satisfying end to their project. The next thing to do is to introduce your main characters. If you're writing fiction, this might be moderately easy, but if you're writing non-fiction, it might seem to you almost impossible. But here's the thing, even non-fiction has a narrative, doesn't it? Even non-fiction has a beginning, a middle and an end. And even non-fiction will reveal conflicts, like I said before. Even if they're only ideological, there should be conflict there. So even in non-fiction, you'd have stories about historical figures, reference figures, touchstone figures, character archetypes, perhaps a focal character that the audience can empathise with, perhaps a mascot figure or some other type of advertising character and any other characters you will hang ideas upon. So you need to make a list of your main characters. And don't forget that the most important character in this equation, and this also applies to fantasy fiction, is the reader. You should have some idea about your ideal reader from the outset. What does she or he look like? What are her or his desires? What are his or her turn-offs? Why would the reader want to read the book? Why would the reader want to finish the book? What will they get out of the book? What's in it for them? The next thing to do is to identify your subplots. Just like in real life, writers, like everybody else, go off the rails sometimes, and when they do, they head down blind alleyways. It is certainly possible that this caused your project to stall which is why it's not been going anywhere for a while. But here's the good news. Distractions in thought, in book writing anyway, are just subplots, because that's all the subplot is. It's a distraction in thought. And subplots are good. Subplots are sensible. Subplots are healthy. Subplots are tangents that need to be explained and examined. They need to be explained before you get yourself and your reader back on track. In other words, back to the main plot or main point of your work. So this part of the process will be unconscionable, I suppose, if you haven't already hammered out your premise. So you do need to go back to that bit again and produce a powerful concept for your book. In other words, the reason you are writing the book before you dare to look at the subplots. But once that premise has taken shape, then go through this list and make a list of subplots and be proud of your subplots because all they are really are distractions in thought and they need to be explained and examined. The next thing to do, and this is going to scare you, is write an elevator pitch for your book. I want to ask my friend what his elevator pitch will be for his 70% finished job 
and I do expect some umming and some ahhing, right? <laughs> How many of us, anyway, write an elevator pitch for our publication before it's completed? I'm willing to bet it's only a handful, if that. However, if you think about it logically, it makes perfect sense to straighten out some kind of elevator pitch quite early on in the writing process. Even though that elevator pitch is bound to be tentative and shaky, it's worth doing early. And for certain, it will help fine tune your authoring plan and it will define your objectives. And don't be put off by the jargon. Now, my wife Sue here, she is a crafter and a needle worker. And while I was writing this piece, I went into her studio to ask her what she was doing. I said, what are you up to? She said, I'm knitting colourful squares that I will stitch together to make a patchwork blanket that I hope will fit a child's bed. And I'm making it as a birthday present. That's it. She just gave me an elevator pitch. So it's not as complicated or as scary as it might sound, is it? And just to remind you, in case you didn't already know, and you're perhaps new to the concept, an elevator pitch is a quick, forceful set of statements that will help sell your book to a publisher and to an agent and chiefly to the reader. Now, it's not the best place here to discuss how best to uh, write an elevator pitch for the project. All I'm saying is do it now before the book is complete. Why? Because it will push you. It will help you overcome the unseen obstacles. It will help you see and perhaps reach the culmination stage of your activity. And the last bit to do is to tell people. The difference between what I call a bedroom project and a totally published manuscript, as I'm sure you already know anyway, is the congregation of an audience. At an early stage, you might be reluctant to envisage a crowd of, a crowd of real people reading your 70% finished book. And that's because your bedroom project, because that's what it is at the moment, has been composed in the safety and privacy of your own home. And probably the only people who know Jack about it are you and your remarkably patient and forbearing partners, the family members and flatmates, etc. that live with you. And you owe them big time, don't you, for their tolerance and for their encouragement. While you've been slaving away, they, of course, have been encouraging. And how should you show them your gratitude? Well, I think in two ways. First, get this darn book published so that they can breathe a sigh of relief that it's now all over. And two, share your book with others so that they, your patient and forbearing partners, family members and flatmates, are not forever propping you and your project up. But who should you tell when you're only 70% of the way through a writing project? Well, for my friend, this would be quite difficult because he doesn't use social media, but he does have a good circle of friends, mostly from an academic background, who will doubtless help him. They don't really need to read what he's written. In fact, I don't think that he, they should read anything at all. And that's, I'm sure, going to be a relief, not only for him, but for the parties. But he should try his elevator pitch on them. And he should do a few other things, and I'll tell you about them in a moment. But if he had social media, I would recommend that he tried his elevator pitch on his followers, probably as a written post, and then a bit later on, if that goes well, as a video message. But the other things he should do on his friends, without asking them to read any of his book, he should be able to reveal the book hook. In other words, why he is writing the book. And at this early stage, he's not telling the world. So no harm can be done if an author can't keep promises or commit to deadlines. So don't worry about that bit of it. And he's only approaching trusted friends and followers. And the reason that he's only approaching those is because these gentle folks will offer suggestions and comments and opinions about the general concept. So that's all you're doing. You're trying to find out about whether your general concept works. Now, if an author wants to thank his helpers for this contribution, probably in the acknowledgement section of, of his book. And incidentally, I highly recommend that you do do that because then they'll offer to help you again and they may well even become willing ARC readers. Then I think that's very welcome. Although I believe it shouldn't be 
spoken of and you shouldn't mention it because you, you don't want it to become a factor in their desire or their willingness to assist. But remember, you're not asking for professional expertise, you're not asking for proofreading, etc. at this stage. All you're doing is bouncing ideas around. If you want, you can glam it up and call it brainstorming, if that will stimulate your friends. But you just want to see how they react to your ideas. Now, if you're an author at any stage of a writing project, I'm sure you will try your best to put this part off. Because in your heart of hearts, you'll expect some backlashes and some flies in the ointment and even some roadblocks. But funny enough, this part of the process puts an unfinished author, those authors who've only done 70% of their work, in a pretty strong and actually, I think, preferable position over a completely entirely finished author because the unfinished author will have the advantage over their colleagues who've perfectly topped off their books and they're just about to send them off to the agents, send off the manuscripts to the publishers, because the unfinished author can make desired changes and modifications and, and amendments without any upheaval, without having to rewrite great flipping chunks of work. So when our fully finished colleagues tell the world about their book, because they really are telling the world about their book, they may be facing a few shocks and they might even run into speculations that could cause them to go back to the drawing board. And I've seen that happen before. But you've already been through that stage. You would have gone through that stage at your 7% mark. So there won't be any nasty shocks for you. So look on the positive side of 70% completion. As the author of a semi-finished work, you're in a much stronger position than a fully completed author because you still have the time and you still have the space and you still have the inclination to make those revisions and those alterations. So instead of worrying about word sprints and 50,000 word challenges and the like to finish off your book, I think you should strive to do the things that I've just mentioned. If you do these things, it will rekindle your interest in your project. It will redirect your thoughts in a constructive way. And it will guide you towards a successful ending that will benefit you and your readers. And finally, it will help stabilise the entire project structure. But whatever you do, please don't blame yourself for getting behind or becoming delayed on this project. Because I have to tell you this, all the greatest artists who have ever lived have unfinished canvases laying around all over the place. It's part of the job description. As a creative, you'll always have finished and semi-finished and never finished projects laying about. And you'll get over this hump. I'm sure of it, especially if you go through that list. So good luck. Let me know how it goes and I'll share your progress on my social networks if you tell me about them. And just to let you know, I described synopsis writing in much greater detail in my blog, which is neilmac, N-E-I-L-M-A-C-H dot me. Neilmac is a one word. And it's called the Smiley Synopsis, S-M-I-L-E-Y Synopsis, S-Y-N-O-P-S-I-S. So that's how to get over your writing log jam. There's eight ways to overcome the stagnation. And that's how to complete a semi-finished work. Let me know how you get on. Good luck with that. And I'll speak to you next week. Happy writing. Bye.